الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على النبي الكريم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته الغر الميامين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون صدق الله مولانا العظيم إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا رحمة للعالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم after praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى and sending salutations peace and blessings upon the best of creation the jewel and crown of creation, the beloved of Allah Almighty, the coolness to our eyes, the purpose of our lives. The reviver of our hearts, the inspirer to our minds, the awakener of our souls, the most honored one, the most praised one, the most generous one, the most kind one, undoubtedly he is the most beautiful one. None other than Sayyiduna Muhammad Rasulullah, صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم. For the last couple of weeks, Imam Adil has been discussing and delivering various points and various discussions on death and the akhirah. If there's one guarantee in life, then it's the guarantee that we must all taste death. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kullu nafsin dha'ikatul maut, every soul shall taste death. Allah Almighty said, Kullu nafsin dha'ika. Dha'ikatul maut. Dha'ika is from the word dhawq. If I'm not mistaken, it's also used in the Urdu language. Isme acha zaika hai. It's very nice taste. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran describes death and the process of death. And when a person dies as an experience of taste for that person, what is death in reality? It's mufarakatu bainal ruhi wal jasad. Death is the separation of the body from the soul. That's the name given to death. In the Western world, where we live here in the UK, in Europe, in America, etc. In the Western world, their understanding and perception of death, maut, is that once a person dies, that's it, it's the end. But according to the Quran, and no doubt it is the Quran that we believe, it is the Quran that we believe. The Quran tells us that Kullu nafsin dha'ikatul maut, every soul shall taste death. It is possible, it is possible. And no doubt, when a person dies, he has left this dunya, but his ruh is still alive. Allah Almighty allows the person's soul to still live. 
That's why the process of leaving this world to enter the next world, for this to take place, Allah created death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created death. And when death was created, it was created for this purpose, that when one will remember or be reminded, when one will remember or be reminded of death, it will detach him from this dunya. And truly, those who remember death, those who do dhikr al those who remember death, you would see that in their lives, they don't have much attachment to the dunya. Because they realize, they come to this realization, they gain this ma'rifa, they gain this gnosis and realization that this dunya is temporary. Nothing is permanent inside this dunya. Everything shall perish. Everything will be destroyed. Everything that Allah has created, that has a beginning, has an end. And the most important factor to come to this realization is dhikrul maut. Excessively remembering death. This is what death does. It allows a person to realize that I have to die. I will die. Therefore, what am I attaching myself to? Isn't it better that we attach ourselves to what is everlasting? Isn't it better that we attach ourselves to what matters? Money comes and goes. Properties will come and go. Cars will come and go. Awlad, children will come and go. But one guarantee, you must face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, O oh man, what has distracted you and deceived you from your generous Lord? What has made you forget Allah? الذي خلقك فصواك فعدلك في أي سورة ما شاء رقبك. What has made you forget Allah? Why have you neglected Him? He created you, He fashioned you, He made you beautiful, yet you've forgotten Him. And what reminds you of Allah? Death. When a person dies, in our families, we've all experienced this. When someone dies in our families, there's sadness in our hearts. We feel the sadness. Then we go to the puri to do ta'ziyat, the matam. We sit there, we make dua. We think, how sad. We've lost someone we love so dearly. Then it's time to wash the body, the person. Then it's time to shroud him. Then to carry him to the janazaga or the masjid where his funeral will be prayed. And after his funeral, he will be carried and taken in the hearse to the graveyard and he will be buried inside the graveyard. And then we will be there making dua for him. That process, though it seems very long, digging the grave, in the world and day and age we live in, the, dave, the graves already dug. Before the body arrives, the, day, the grave is already dug. It's ready. That land, I will tell you now, is already for you right now. Where you will be buried is written. It's possible that you walk past it every single day. You drive past Cemetery Road every day. But do we realize possibly this might be my home? A, a home longer than the home that we have here. The life inside the grave 
is far longer than the life in this world. My father lived 50 years. My cousin lived 22 years. Possibly your father lived 70 years, 65 years. I talk about personal experiences that I can relate to. No doubt, Qiyamat is a good time away from now. Though the signs are very close and are appearing in great abundance, the day of judgment, Allah knows when it will be. When the trumpet will be blown. True, but the time that my father will spend in his grave, that I will spend in my grave, is far longer than my time on this earth. And we live on this earth as if we will live forever. That's the sad reality. We walk on this earth as if we will walk forever. We work on this land as if we will work forever. How much of our time have we invested into our grave and akhirah? How much time have we invested into the next world? Most of our time is spent sleeping. There are 24 hours in a day, of which 8 hours are spent on average asleep. That leaves you with how many hours? 16. If you work Monday to Friday, 9 till 5, that's 8 hours at work. That leaves you with 8 hours. In those 8 hours, 1 hour is spent praying. Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. Combine the time it takes to pray. It's one hour. One hour Allah asks from 24. One hour from 24 hours Allah asks you, give me time. I have right over you. Worship me and none but me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to pray five times a day. Monday to Friday, for example, weekends are far free. You spend time with your family. Even then, today you ask someone, come to the masjid, pray your salah, learn the deen. And the best excuse he has is, Imam Sab, I don't have time. Time kuni. Busy. It's the best excuse. It's the most worn out excuse that we use. Unfortunately, when we need to make time to watch the latest movie at View Cinema, we will take time out. If we have to watch the World Cup final on Sunday, we will take seven hours out and watch the cricket. If we have to go to a wedding, we'll spend four hours, three hours, two hours at a wedding. But you ask a person, let's go to the graveyard. Illa ma sha Allah. Illa ma sha Allah. With the exception of many. But there are far more. If you say to them, let's go to the graveyard, they won't go. You say to them, let's go and pray in the masjid. There is a talk. No time. Because iPhones, smartphones, Smartphones are very intelligent. They're man-made. Man has made this phone. Insan, Allah has given so much akal, has made this phone. This phone is a very powerful tool. In the day and age that we live in, we can't live with it and we can't live without it. It is very useful. There are maps on here to tell you, give you directions where to go. It's very useful. Because this very phone, you can now download books and read instead of buying books from W.H. Smith. This phone is very useful. You go on a jog, it tells you how many miles you've run, how many kilometers. This phone is very useful. You can take pictures and store it into your memory. You can download PDFs, videos, music, all sorts on these phones now. These phones are very intelligent. Insan, man has made this phone. Man. In this phone, we can get our emails, text messages, we communicate. But how much time do we spend on the phone? I don't know about 
Androids and Samsungs, because I am an iPhone, Apple lover. I know on Apple, you can check your phone usage. It will tell you how many hours on average you are on your phone. I can check. Including myself, including myself. We must spend on average 9, 10, 11, 12 hours on our phones. Whether that's playing games, whether that's reading books, whether that's surfing the internet, watching YouTube. It's possible from those 12 hours, not every hour is bad. You may do good through this phone. You can download the Quran and read the Quran on this phone. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We can't say these phones are entirely bad. No. It's how we use these phones on our time. Coming back to the point, time. Where is our time? It's the biggest, most worn out excuse. I don't have time. I don't have time. Too busy. Nobody is too busy. If we have to make time, we will make time. If we have to make time, we will make time. There's no denying that. Question is, how do you use your time? I've established there is time. But how do you use your time? How productive is your time? My brothers, we can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, sitting, walking, talking. When you are walking, when you are doing work, you can do dhikrullah. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah. Quietly in your mind you can do dhikr. Verbally on your tongue you can do dhikr. You can take time out and read the Quran. If you are hafiz of the Quran, you can read the Quran by heart. There's no excuse. For example, Haji Sahib is sat here. Their lips are moving. He's not muttering, he's doing dhikr, for example. All of you sat here right now could be doing dhikr whilst listening to me speak. But it's who Allah gives tawfiq to. I have met people in my life that by Allah there's not a moment that passes them by except they do dhikrullah. Every moment. In their mind, they are doing dhikr. In the, on their tongue, they are doing dhikr. They are thinking. And you know what? They're also working. Let me narrate to you a very famous sto story. The story is about the great Imam of the Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. He was born Ghaliban 164 Hijri. He is the student of Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i. And he lived in Baghdad. He was born in a city called Marwaz. Marwaz. And then he moved to Baghdad. Very famous Imam. Sahibul Madhab. Sayyiduna Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. Radiyallahu an. He was renowned and known as the Mujaddid of al Thani. He was the Mujaddid, the reviver of the second century. Rasulullah said, at the beginning or at the end of every century, every 100 years, Allah Almighty will send a man or men, even a woman. Allah Almighty will send certain people. He will choose certain people. Who he will revive the deen, do tajdeed of the deen. They will be known as the mujaddids, revivers. The mujaddid of the first century, ulama have written, is Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Sayyidina Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The mujaddid, the reviver, that means that in the first 100 years of Islam, after the time of the Sahaba, the one who contributed the most to the spreading and preservation of Islam was Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And a mujaddid is he whom there is ittifaq. 
It is unanimously agreed about him that he is the greatest imam of our time. The greatest imam of the second century was Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. There is no denying. Ayyamul Mihna, during the days of test and tribulation, when the government of that time, the ruling party of that time, started spreading the belief and notion that the Quran is created. The Quran is what? Created. But the Quran is not created. Why? Because it is the word of Allah. Kalamullah. And Kalamullah ghair makhluk. Allah Ta'ala's word is not created. Allah Almighty's sifat attributes are not created. Kalam is an attribute of Allah. Imam Ahmed fought against this. He was fought, imprisoned. Punished, lashed, tortured, abused, disrespected in his time. When Imam Ahmad remained staunch on this Aqidah and spoke out against this fitna of that time, Allah honored Imam Ahmad with a lot of izzat. Allah honored him and he was well known worldwide. All over the Muslim world, everyone knew who Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was. But there were times where in remote villages, people didn't know. On this one occasion, Imam Ahmad was very old. He was traveling and on his way, night had fallen and he wanted to spend time in the masjid. So he said to the caretaker of the masjid, this is not an illness of our time that many caretakers of the masjid say, get out of the masjid, closing it, closing it, no time. It's common now, but it was happening then as well. And they said, uh, he said to the old man, or the caretaker, Imam Ahmad said, look, I want to spend the night in the house of Allah. I have nowhere to stay. I don't know anyone here. I want to spend the night in the masjid. In the morning after Fajr, I will be gone. The old man said, no, you can't stay in the masjid, get out. It's the house of Allah, get out of the masjid. Imam Ahmad went and rested in one corner. This man got very angry, dragged Imam Ahmad. He didn't know who he was. Dragged Imam Ahmad and threw him out of the masjid. He was old, Imam Ahmad was very old now. Remember, he was lashed hundred times. He was tortured for his aqidah. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal radiallahu an. He went and he stayed outside in the courtyard of the masjid. He rested in the courtyard and the man came and said, I told you, you can't stay in the vicinity of the masjid. Get out. Get out of the masjid. Get out of here. Dragged him and threw him outside the gates. Whilst this was happening, there were some shops in front of the masjid. One shop was a baker's shop. He owned a bakery. And in the bakery, of course, he was making bread, etc. He seen that Imam Ahmad was being tortured, being oppressed, abused. He felt sorry for Imam Ahmad. He didn't know who Imam Ahmad was. Bear in mind, he didn't know who this old man was. He felt sorry for him and he said, come with me. Come with me and I will... You can stay with me tonight and in the morning you can be gone. All night the baker was baking bread for the morning because he was going to sell it after Fajr. Imam Ahmed that night didn't sleep. He was listening to what the baker was reading whilst he was baking. He was working but the baker was reading something. In the morning Imam Ahmed asked him, so tell me something. Last night I stayed awake. I heard you reciting something. What was you reading? What is your litany, your wird? He said, I am reading istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. I am doing kasratul istighfar. Excessively I am doing istighfar. I am doing istighfar upon istighfar upon all night. Whilst I am baking, 
I am making the bread, the dough, etc. I am putting it into the oven, taking it out. Throughout this process, all night, his tongue was moving with istighfar. Imam Ahmad said, tell me something. What have you gained and benefited from reciting istighfar? What has Allah given you for this istighfar? This man said, Allah Almighty has accepted every single dua of mine. Through istighfar, Allah has accepted all my duas except one dua. Till today, this dua hasn't been accepted. He said, what is this dua? Listen very carefully. He said, I heard and I have heard that there is a great Imam on this earth. His name is Ahmed bin Hanbal. And I want to meet him. My dua is, there is a great Imam on this earth. His name is Ahmed bin Hanbal. And I want to meet him. This is the only dua that hasn't been accepted. Imam Ahmed said to him, Allah Almighty sent me to you through all of this so that your dua is accepted. My brothers, this is the power of istighfar. And this is the power of spending your time doing the dhikr of Allah. Even when you're working, you can remember Allah. Remember Allah Almighty. Udhkurullah yadhkurkum in my khutbah. Remember Allah, Allah will remember you. Fadhkuruni adhkurkum. For Allah said in the Quran, Remember me and I will cause your remembrance to be done. This is why my brothers, we should spend our time wisely. Death is around the corner. We can die at any time. Rasulullah was asked, Manil akyas ya Rasulullah. Who is the most intelligent one? Nabi Ali Salatu Salam said, Intelligent isn't he who hoards dirhams and dinars, dollars and dimes. Nabi Ali Salatu Salam said, Intelligent is he who remembers death often and prepares for his death. Preparing for death is very difficult. You'll remember it. I've reminded you now, I've reminded myself in. 35, 40 minutes, we'll forget. We'll go back to work, etc. My brothers, the grave remembers us every single day. The grave says, Ana baytul ghurba, Ana baytul wahsha, Ana baytul dood, Ana baytul zulma, Ana baytul wahda. I am the house of darkness. I am the house of worms. I am the house of difficulty. I am the house of oneness. You will be alone with me. When a person dies, he is buried and everything follows him to his grave. His wealth follow him. His children follow him. His a'mal follow him. When he is inside that grave, my brothers, let me tell you something. It's a known fact that the person in the grave knows who comes to visit him. The person in the grave, he is your salam. The person in the grave sees what you are doing when you come to see him. Why? Even though the body has tasted death, the ruh is still alive. Allah Almighty said, and behind them is a barzakh. What is barzakh? Hijab. It is a veil. Barzakh is the waiting room. It's the room where the souls are kept and stay after death until Yawmul Qiyamah. When the first trumpet will be blown, up until that moment, when we die, our souls will stay in Barzakh. It's another world. It's another dunya. It's the world where the souls are kept between death and resurrection. This is Barzakh. Hijabun or Hajizun as the ulama have written. بَيْنَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْقِيَامَةِ 
And this is why, however you live your life in this dunya, that's the level of the barzakh that you will receive. If you lived a good life of righteousness and piety and fear of Allah, then you will have a VVIP standard in barzakh. Our ulama explain, you know, when you go to the train station waiting for the train, you go to the airport waiting to board the plane. You know that waiting room, you can stay with everyone else or you can upgrade to the VIP lounge. You can upgrade to the VVVIP lounge, very, very important people's lounge. You can buy this in the dunya. My brothers, in the akhirah, you can't buy this. The time to buy it is now. If you want top standard lounge in Barzakh, then it's very important for you today to make your akhirah right now. Pray now, fast now. Do good now, for this is what will benefit you on the day of Qiyamah. This is what will benefit you inside your grave. When you are buried, the angels will come, Munkar and Nakir, the two angels. They will sit the person up and they will ask him. I will just mention what Bukhari, Rahmatullah, Al-Imam, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari mentioned. Imam al-Bukhari, Rahimahullah, in his Sahih, he said that there's only one question the angels will ask inside the grave. It's famous amongst us that there are three questions. Man rabbuka, ma deenuka, man ma kunta taqulu fi haqqi hadha rajul what is your religion? Who is your Lord? These questions. No. Bukhari Rahmatullah says, there is only one question. What is that question? Rasulullah will come inside your grave. You will see them. You will visualize them. And the angel will ask, tell me, ma kunta taqulu fi haqqi hadha rajul What did you used to say about this man? How did you live your life? According to his way or against his way? And it is at that time that you will be asked this question and you will be made to answer in the Arabic language. If you don't know who Rasulullah is today, how will you know who he is inside your grave? That's why brothers, take time out and learn and study his life. Study his life. Study the life of Rasulullah and benefit from his life. Learn the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. He is our greatest role model and example. And if the person answers these questions correctly, the angels will say, Numka nomatil uruz. Sleep now, rest now. The grave will be extended for him as far had al basar, as far as his eye can see. There will be a window put inside his grave from the gardens of gardens of paradise. The fragrance of Jannah will pass through his grave and his soul will be relaxing in barzakh in the, the bodies of green birds and he will be roaming in Jannatul Firdaus. This is for who? The mu'min, the one who has iman, the one who believes in Allah and fears Allah. May Allah Almighty make us from amongst those people. May Allah Almighty grant us husn al khatima, grant us a righteous and pious death and allow us to pass away on a Friday. For he who passes away on Friday the punishment of the grave will be free from him. He who passes away on Thursday night or Yomul Jumu'ah, he will be saved from the punishments of the grave. We make dua that Allah saves us from the punishments and the adab of the qabr. Wa akulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wa akhlu da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.